We have um, two speakers participating in this session, Jennifer Benjamin and Vicki Blazer. Um, by way of introduction, Jennifer Benjamin is a project manager at Corona Environmental Consulting, and Dr. Vicki Blazer is a research fishery biologist with the USGS Eastern Ecological Science Center at the Leetown Research Laboratory. So during the session, I'd like to again invite everyone to submit questions via the chat box, and we'll pull questions from that chat box for Q&A at the end of the session, if time per permits. Um, also, just as a heads up, I'll be providing a verbal two minute warning to our speakers if needed to help um, keep us on time for this session. So Jennifer Benjamin is up first to speak about finding potential sources of PFAS in the Potomac Basin. Uh, Jennifer, please feel free to share your slides and um, begin your presentation when you're able. Great, thank you very much. Um, just Get this out here. Can everyone see my slides? Is it full screen? Yes, it is. All right, thank you. All righty. Okay, so um, thank you, Heidi. Um, so in this presentation, I'll start off um, just by reviewing the state of PFAS regulation um, throughout the country, um, which I'm, I'm sure you guys will hear a lot about today. Um, I'll then be walking through a case study um, of a potential PFAS source inventory that we completed uh, along with uh, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and its member water utilities. Um, and so I'll start off with a little bit of background on uh, MWCOG for anyone who's not familiar. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the state law related to PFAS that is applicable to MWCOG's member utilities. I'll then walk through an overview of the method that we used in order to compile the uh, potential PFAS source inventory. Um, I'll give you guys a, a little snapshot of our results, um, and then I'll talk about some potential applications for uh, this inventory and, and similar, um, similar inventories. Um, I'll then uh, talk about some key takeaways, and then I'll finish off with uh, just a list of useful resources for anyone that is interested in learning more about uh, PFAS or PFAS sources. So there's been a lot of uh, regulatory action uh, surrounding PFAS at at the uh, federal level in recent years, especially in the past couple of years. Um, in 2021, the EPA came out with their uh, uh, PFAS strategic roadmap, which outlines um, actions and commitments that the EPA plans to take uh, in order to address PFAS risks over the next few years. Um, of course, the, uh, earlier this year, the EPA also lowered their health advisories for PFOA and PFOS um, from 70 parts per trillion down to uh, 0.004 uh, parts per trillion for um, PFOA and 0.02 parts per trillion for PFOS. Um, at the same time, they also came out with um, health advisories of 10 parts per trillion for Gen X chemicals and 2,000 parts per trillion for PFDS. Um, of course, the EPA is also in the process of developing their own um, MCLs for PFOA and PFOS, which are um, expected to be finalized next year. And then uh, the upcoming UCMR5 um, is going to be including 30 chemicals, um, 29 of which are PFAS, um, which is up um, significantly from the, the six that were included in UCMR3. Um, there's also been a lot of uh, state action recently surrounding PFAS, um, uh, in recent years especially. Um, so as of the date of, of uh, this presentation, um, there are at least seven states that have adopted either um, a final or MCL or interim MCLs for um, one or more PFAS ahead of the EPA. And uh, a lot of other states have come out with their own um, either health advisories or, or their other forms of guidance. And up until the EPA uh, uh, came out with new health advisories for PFOA and PFOS, um, all the state uh, adopted health advisories and other forms of guidance were either equal to or more stringent than the EPA health advisory of uh, 70 parts per trillion for um, PFOA and PFOS. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, um, so MWCOG is an uh, independent nonprofit association of water utilities in suburban Maryland, Northern Virginia, and D.C. And we've been working with them uh, since 2015, uh, first to develop 
and then to um, maintain a source water threat inventory for the Potomac River watershed. And um, then in 2020, um, largely in response to you know the changing regulatory environment around PFAS um, and you know the notoriety that those chemicals have gotten, um, MWCOG then partnered with us again in order to identify potential sources of PFAS throughout the same region. And this was really intended to be uh, just a first step in what would be an ongoing effort to uh, track, analyze, and assess risks um, related to PFAS throughout the region. Um, so in the state of Maryland uh, in particular, um, which is of course one of the states that intersects the Potomac River watershed, um, there's been uh, quite a bit of uh, action surrounding PFAS uh, in recent years. So um, the Maryland Department of the Environment um, in particular has done uh, quite a bit of sampling for PFAS in recent years. Um, in September of 2020, they initiated a three-phase sampling effort. Um, so in phase one of that effort, uh, which ran from September of 2020 through September, uh, February of 2021, um, 137 water treatment plants covering uh, 60 community water systems were sampled for uh, 18 PFAS. And then out of those 137 water treatment plants, 10% um, of those um, plants were sampled for an additional 11 PFAS. Um, and then in phase two, which ran from March through May of 2021, um, uh, 167 sites were sampled for the same 18 PFAS um, that were covered in phase one. And then uh, phase three ran from uh, August 2021 through spring of this year. And uh, we have less details on that phase at the moment, um, but the results of that um, phase are to be published uh, either later this year or in early 2023. Um, so uh, the MD has also been um, making their own effort in order to identify um, potential PFAS sources. Um, so they have uh, created a GIS database of potential PFAS sources throughout the state, which then has helped them to uh, prioritize water sources for PFAS sampling. And um, I haven't uh, seen this GIS database anywhere. It doesn't seem to be something that's public facing, um, although it may be something that they will release upon request. Um, so that remains to be seen. And then uh, there has been a little bit of regulatory action um, in the state of Maryland uh, related to PFAS. Um, so the Maryland, Maryland currently doesn't have any MCLs for um, any PFAS, um, and they're currently using the EPA health advisory levels as their primary actionable thresholds until the point where uh, the EPA comes out with their, um, their own MCLs uh, for PFOA and PFOS. Um, although they have said that they are considering um, developing their own MCLs and may do so ahead of the EPA. Um, so it's very likely that they'll come out with their own um, MCLs um, fairly soon. And then the, the MDA has also said that they plan to use um, PFAS-specific funding set aside in the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, in order to um, address PFAS exposure risks throughout the state. Um, and so um, there's a sign that they, they, they plan to continue to invest in um, PFAS risk mitigation throughout the state. Now in the state of Virginia, um, uh, House Bills 586 and 1257 were passed back in January of 2020. Um, House Bill 586 um, required that the state convene a work group um, which uh, was tasked with sampling up to 50 community water systems, um, evaluating approaches, approaches to regulating PFAS, and then actually recommending MCLs to the uh, Virginia Department of Health. Um, the work group uh, issued um, their final report back uh, in 2021. Um, late, as of the, the latest news that I've heard um, is that they uh, um, they're recommending that um, the state of Virginia wait until uh, the EPA is finished with their work in order to, uh, or before, before issuing an MCL. Um, and if the, they've said that if the state of Virginia wants to um, develop an MCL ahead of the EPA, then it should set it at the EPA's current health advisory level. Um, and that's just so they don't end up having to adjust their MCL um, to be consistent with the EPA's MCLs. Um, and then House Bill 1257, which goes along with um, uh, House Bill 586, um, required the uh, Virginia Department of Health to adopt MCLs um, that are protective of public health for PFOA, PFOS, and um, any other PFAS compounds that um, as it sees fit, um, uh, along with chromium-6 and 1,4-dioxane. Um, now, the, the, uh, this bill required that the Department of Health report their findings to the Virginia Senate Committee as of um, October 1st uh, of 2021. Um, Although when they issued the report, they said that um, the, the uh, report deadline um, came before 
the um, amendment to the state code that was promulgated by House Bill 1257 um, took effect on January 1st of 2022, um, as well as before the, uh, the state work group um, had actually finished their, their work. And so they said that they didn't have enough um, information um, at the time in order to um, uh, establish MCLs. Um, and so uh, they didn't really start the process of developing um, MCLs until um, the, the bill um, or the law took effect on January 1st of 2022. Um, so, they haven't come out with MCLs yet, but we um, should be seeing those fairly soon. So, based on the uh, state and federal actions surrounding, surrounding PFAS and um, just the general publicity that those chemicals have gotten, um, MWCOG decided they wanted to be proactive in, um, and, and begin assessing uh, uh, potential PFAS sources um, that could potentially impact the water systems within the Potomac River watershed. And so now that we've talked a little bit about the, the why, um, I want to shift into talking a little bit about the how. Um, and so the method that we ended up using in order to identify potential PFAS sources was a five-step process. Um, the first step in the process was to define our study area. And um, if you're doing this sort of assessment when you're trying to set your study area, if you already have a, a zone of concern or, or a wellhead protection area, that's a, that's a really good place to start. Um, you can also set your search area to, um, say, a certain radius from your wellhead or your intake, um, or you can you might decide that you want to expand your search to, uh, say, your entire watershed or, or uh, your county or multiple counties. Um, it's really up to you, but it's important to remember um, that uh, the size of your study area ultimately determines the amount of data that you need to collect and, uh, therefore, the amount of time that you need to spend filtering. Um, now, when we put this uh, inventory together for MWCOG, um, for the most part, we used our um, source water um, zones of concern that we had developed back in 2015 as part of our source water threat assessment um, uh, as our study area. Um, although in some cases we found that where we had data that was um, easy to filter on a large scale, um, in those cases we found that we could uh, expand our uh, study area beyond the zones of concern without adding much additional effort to the project. And so in some cases we did um, identify potential PFAS sources outside of those zones of concern. Um, up to the boundaries of the counties that intersected those zones of concern. Um, and then uh, in step two, uh, the next step once the study area is defined is to uh, determine what types of PFAS you're interested in. Um, now, if you were just to, to apply this method yourself, um, a good place to start is by looking at um, which, uh, if any, PFAS are, are being regulated within your state. Um, along with any detections that might have occurred within your watershed. Um, so you can take a look at you know, your own sampling data or any PFAS sampling data that's available from the state. Um, there are also some really great nationwide sources of, of PFAS sampling data out there, like uh, the PFAS contamination site tracker map um, from the Environmental Working Group through North, Northeastern University. Um, and uh, when, we, when we applied this method for MWCOG, we ultimately decided that we didn't want to uh, limit our study in this way. So we, we decided to um, look for all sources of all um, PFAS and not, not limit our um, list in any way. And then uh, in step three, uh, uh, so once we knew uh, what PFAS we were interested in, um, we, uh, the next step was then to identify high-risk industry sources of those PFAS. And um, this helped us determine you know, what types of data resources we needed to collect and, and review. Um, once we then had a list of high-risk industries, um, we then could look for data sets available from um, state, federal, and, and local agencies um, that either captured or were in some way indicative of facilities within those industries. Um, then the, the data sets we ended up collecting um, in most cases were created um, for purposes other than PFAS source identification, and so we found that in most cases um, the data sets we collected needed to be um, filtered in order to remove any um, irrelevant or, or low-risk facilities that they included. And then uh, uh, ordinarily the last step in this process is to do a web search for facilities belonging to companies that have um, uh, historically used or, or manufactured PFAS. Um, so this would include your, your um, big name companies like uh, 3M and, and DuPont. Um, and this step helps to ensure that you're capturing facilities um, that are that uh, belong to companies that are uh, sort of infamous um, for having manufacturer use uh, PFAS, but that might not, for whatever reason, been um, captured by the data sets that you've collected. Um, it can also help to pull in um, facilities that 
uh, either manufacture or use uh, PFAS replacement chemicals, um, uh, which again might not have been captured by the data sets you end up collecting, um, particularly if you're focused on looking for sources of a very particular um, subset of PFAS that um, doesn't include uh, replacement chemicals for those PFAS. Um, now, we didn't end up ultimately applying this step uh, when we put the inventory together for MWCOG. Um, it just wasn't a part of our method at the time. Um, but since we've applied this method for other water utilities, um, it's, it's kind of become a common um, uh, component of our method. Um, and so I've included it on this list, and I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit more about it. So this method um, is ultimately uh, based on using publicly available um, information in order to identify facilities in um, industries that have historically been involved in either the, the use, manufacture, or disposal of materials that contain PFAS. And um, so this is a list of high-risk industries that um, we've identified based on discussions with experts in the water industry who have done their own work um, tracing PFAS detections back to their sources. And a lot of the industries on this list were targeted because they're likely users of um, AFFF firefighting foams, um, uh, which of course is one of the, the most prevalent and, and well-known sources of PFAS. Um, and so that category would include uh, facilities like um, firefighting training facilities and uh, fire stations, uh, airports, and, and military facilities. And then other uh, industries on this list were um, identified because they are indirect sources of PFAS. So um, they might not um, uh, manufacture or um, store any PFAS chemicals, but uh, they um, handle either wastewater or solid waste that contain one or more PFAS. And so that category would include, uh, you know, your um, incinerators, landfills, uh, wastewater dischargers, um, wastewater treatment plants, and also um, biosolids production and, and application sites. And then uh, the rest of the industri industries on this list were identified uh, because they are likely to use PFAS in, in some sort of manufacturing. And also, uh, I will say that the EPA has come out with a very similar list um, in recent years as part of their um, PFAS strategic roadmap. Um, so they have a list that's a very, very, very similar to this one, um, and we'll be reviewing um, the list that they came out with and comparing it to our list and um, uh, combining them where we can, making them more consistent. Now, uh, once we identified a, um, our uh, high-risk industries that we wanted to target, um, we then uh, reviewed federal and um, state data resources um, for any data that would help us to identify facilities within those um, target high-risk and high-risk industries. And so, um, these are some of the federal data resources that we found to be um, most useful. Um, now, of course, if you were to apply this method yourself, um, you'd have to do your own uh, data source review in order to collect any any relevant data um, specific to your area, but um, of course, the federal data resources that we listed here are, um, aren't exclusive and they're, they're available to everyone. Um, now, out of this list, uh, we found the EPA's um, Enforcement and Compliance History Online, or, or ECHO database, uh, to be um, one of the most useful um, because that particular database includes um, compliance information for really just about um, every regulated or, or permit, permitted industry, and um, it also includes um, NAICS industry codes, which then allows you to um, actually filter the database um, by industry type, which is really useful. And then uh, as far as state, state data resources go, um, so state data resources can really vary um, widely from state to state, um, but generally we find that state, state data resources are, or state agencies are um, useful sources of um, things like manufacturing facilities that are, are regulated under state programs, um, as well as data related to uh, indirect sources of PFAS, like uh, your waste facilities and, and wastewater treatment plants. Now, a lot of state agencies have also um, done their own PFAS assessments or surveys, um, like the state of Maryland, for example. Um, so it's really worth taking a look at what your state has already done. Um, some states have done you know, PFAS sampling programs. Others have done um, surveys of, in order to identify um, manufacturers or, or likely sources of PFAS. Um, and then other states have done a combination of two, uh, of the two, um, again, like the state of Maryland. Um, there are also some really great publicly available sources of detection data out there um, that you can use in order to identify um, PFAS that have been uh, detected in your area. 
Um, and so one of the ones that we found to be most useful was the um, uh, uh, Environmental Working Group's PFAS Contamination Site Tracker Map. So that's an online map um, open to the public um, and uh, includes voluntarily submitted data related to PFAS detection sites. Um, although I will um, mention that, you know, when you're using uh, this and, and similar sources, it's important to keep in mind that you really should be taking the data with a grain of salt. Um, we, we were told by um, uh, a couple uh, water utilities that um, the data within the PFAS contamination site tracker map, um, uh, at least some of it appears to be inaccurate. And so it's important to just remember, um, you know, when you're using these, these public-facing uh, data resources that um, you should be taking the, the data with a grain of salt. Um, so uh, once we um, reached the point of collecting all the data that was uh, relevant to those high-risk industries that we were targeting, um, we then um, found that we, in most cases, had to filter our data in order to remove um, any low-risk or, or non-risk or relevant um, facilities that were included in those data sets. And so um, there are really a number of different approaches that you can take um, to filtering uh, your data. And when we applied this method for MWCOG, um, we um, applied a, a really a combination of several different um, filtering approaches. And the approach that we used for any one particular data set depended on the, the type and the amount of information that came with the data from the source. Um, so generally speaking, if a data set came with um, any sort of data fields that could um, help us determine whether or not a facility was in one of those high-risk industries that we were targeting, um, or any fields that could help us evaluate risk level, um, in those cases, we would filter the data um, just using the provided data fields alone. Um, some, of the, some examples of the types of data fields that we'd be looking for would include things like um, you know, facility type fields um, or facilities uh, fields indicating uh, what, type, what types of chemicals are being stored or, or used on site, um, or for wastewater data in particular, um, uh, we found that you know, fields indicating volume of discharge were particularly helpful because that would give us an idea of the um, facility size and, and amount of material moving through the facility on a regular basis. Um, of course, you know, the more, more material that's moving through the facility, the more likely it is that that facility is to be um, a significant source of PFAS. Um, other data sets uh, came with, or either came with or could be matched to um, data containing NAICS or uh, SICK industry codes. Um, and we found that those data sets were particularly useful um, or, or usually the easiest to filter um, because we could filter those down to uh, the records that included codes that were representative of those high-risk industries that we were targeting. And then it also wasn't uncommon uh, to encounter data that was in, in formats um, that uh, weren't easily filtered using electronic means. And so for those sources, we found that we had to um, manually review them, um, meaning that we had to manually um, add any relevant records from those sources um, to our inventory. Um, and so this category included things like um, PFAS contamination site tracker map that we looked at, um, and also any um, PDF reports that we, that we encountered. Um, it's not uncommon, you know, for example, to um, encounter state-level PFAS assessments that are in a, a PDF uh, report format. And then uh, also, when, when we're applying this method, we often find that there are um, often data sets that we don't end up filtering at all, um, either because uh, those, we find that all of the data in, uh, with, included in those data sets are, are relevant, meaning that they're all potential sources of PFAS. Um, or um, in other cases, uh, it's because the data simply didn't come with enough information in order to allow us to filter it. Uh, now, as an added step, um, some groups that have applied this method, um, including MWCOG, um, have decided to either remove or in some way distinguish um, indirect sources of PFAS in some way. Um, since those types of facilities aren't your you know, typical sources of PFAS and that they're um, they generally can't or, or shouldn't be held liable for um, having PFAS on site. Um, and so whether or not um, you ultimately decide uh, to include those, those types of facilities within your inventory will really depend on how you're planning to use the inventory. Um, when we were putting an inventory together for MWCOG, um, we did take these sources, um, these indirect sources, out of our um, the main inventory that we developed, um, although we did retain them uh, just for future reference um, because they are technically sources of PFAS. They're just indirect sources. You have two minutes remaining in your time. Oh, <laughs> uh, so I'll try to speed up a little bit. Um, 
uh, just to the final step in the process, as I mentioned, is usually to actually fill in gaps in the inventory by searching directly for um, PFAS manufacturers um, by name. Um, so this is the at the top of the slide here. We have a list of target um, companies or, or companies that we'll typically target um, when we're doing this sort of search, and we'll uh, go through uh, act, we'll go through Google Maps and actually search for um, facilities belonging to these companies um, by name. Um, also, uh, a lot of times these companies will list their major subsidiaries on their websites. Um, so a lot of times you can actually search for um, you know their major subsidiaries or brand names as well. Um, and then as we're going to, and we're doing the search, we'll typically um, uh, try to filter out any facilities that appear to be corporate headquarters or um, commercial retail locations, as those tend to be you know low, lower or non-risk sites. Um, we also typically will do a keyword search for facilities that um, have any um, keywords in their names that um, seem to indicate that they're within one of those high-risk industries. And again, we'll, we'll filter our results to remove any, any facilities that appear to be just corporate headquarters or um, retail locations. Uh, we also typically will uh, review uh, or look for any sort of searchable state-owned databases that uh, uh, can be searched um, allow, or allow us to search across several state programs uh, for facilities by name or by keyword. Um, so this would include uh, databases that are essentially the, the state equivalent of the EPA's facility registry system database. Um, and again, we'll do the same sort of um, search by, by name or by keyword in those databases where we find them. And then uh, as a last step, we will usually actually check the websites for those uh, target companies on our list um, to see if we can identify any manufacturing locations that we might have missed. Uh, so here's just a quick sample of what our results typically look like, um, at least for a moderately urban area. Um, so you can see that for a more uh, industrial or urban area, um, you get a really diverse set of facility types. And um, if you're in a more industrial or urban area, it's very likely you'll see a, a, a lot more manufacturing facilities. Um, whereas if you're doing this sort of inventory, inventory in a much more rural area, you'll likely see um, more things related to, to infrastructure. So um, you'll see it's a, a higher pro proportion of things like, um, you know, fire stations, for example. Um, now, since the, uh, we put this inventory together, um, the EPA has come out with several new data sets um, related to potential PFAS sources. A lot of these are um, subsets of existing um, federal programs or, or data sets that um, the EPA um, were already available from the EPA um, that the EPA has then uh, filtered down to those facilities that appear to be um, potential PFAS sources. And so we plan to actually review these new sources this year and cross-reference them against our existing uh, list of potential PFAS sources and updating our list wherever we need to. Uh, so these are some of the potential applications for the inventory that we developed. Um, uh, of course, there are a lot more um, that aren't on this list, but these are the ones that uh, MWE COG envisioned. Um, and so essentially what they wanted to do was um, expand upon the source water threat inventory we'd previously developed um, and are, are currently managing for them. Um, they want to prepare for, um, you know, having conversations with facility managers and regulators. Um, they also wanted to uh, be able to share information about potential PFAS sources and risks with all their member water utilities throughout the region. Um, in the short term, uh, they also saw this inventory uh, helping to um, target PFAS sampling efforts uh, throughout the region. And then the long term, along with you know, further investigation stemming from this inventory, um, they saw this inventory potentially leading to helping utilities um, evaluate treatment options um, in relation to PFAS contamination risks in their system or to their system, uh, identifying those drinking water sources and systems that are, that are most at risk, at risk and might need, be in need of more um, investment, and then also um, eventually um, estimating the potential impact of things like sampling um, treatment and other mitigation efforts on um, their budgets and rates. And so here are the key takeaways, which I'll go through really quickly. Um, so uh, uh, first and foremost, um, state and federal re regulations surrounding PFAS are, of course, evolving uh, quite rapidly, and it's a good idea to get under an understanding of the uh, PFAS risk your system uh, before you're faced with stringent regulations. Um, a lot of states are also doing their own um, PFAS sampling and um, uh, encouraging water systems to voluntarily sample for PFAS. And then in those cases, um, a lot of times they're requiring um, systems to report um, or notify the public whenever PFAS is detected in their systems, which of course can uh, 
cause um, negative pre public perception and, and communication issues, um, even though those, those water systems weren't actually required to um, sample for PFAS in, in the first place. Um, so showing that you're making an effort to actually identify sources of PFAS um, or contamination sources can really help improve, improve uh, your public Im image if you're, you're, you find yourself within that situation. Um, I'll just skip down a little bit. So um, of course, the good news is that uh, new data are becoming available um, quite rapidly, both sampling and, and PFAS source data. So it's really easier now more than ever in order to um, identify potential PFAS sources. Um, also, uh, uh, I guess the final takeaway here is really that, um, so I want you to, to know that uh, putting together the sort of uh, inventory of potential P PFAS sources is really a, a useful tool for um, uh, you know, regulatory support and source water threat management, uh, public communications, and, and cost recovery as well, um, as well as, uh, you know, for designing PFAS monitoring programs and actually to, uh, in order to um, isolate sources and contaminated sites. And while the process of actually identifying P PFAS sources can be um, time-consuming, um, it's both, you know, possible and worth doing. And so that concludes the presentation. Um, here's a list of uh, helpful resources if anyone wants more information, um, and I'd be happy to share these slides with, with anyone who is interested. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I've seen a, a couple of questions come in through the chat box. As a, as a reminder, we're going to get to those questions at the end of the session, if time permits. So if you have a question, um, please, and you haven't already submitted it through the chat box, please just get it into the queue. Um, and so with that, let's move on to Dr. Uh, Vicki Blazer to speak about spatial and temporal variations in PFOS concentrations in smallmouth bass. Um, Dr. Blazer, please feel free to share your screen and proceed with your presentation. Okay, are you seeing it? Yes, thank All you. Right. Thanks. Um, so for quite a few years, we've been doing uh, health assessments in smallmouth bass, uh, in response to fish kills, uh, incidences of skin lesions, endocrine disruptions such as intersex, and population declines in certain watersheds of the Chesapeake. And in those assessments, we look at a variety of biological inputs from uh, the organismal to the molecular. So we're looking at documenting visible abnormalities, condition factor, we collect blood, uh, we were primarily doing this for plasma vitelligenin, but we, we froze aliquots for future analysis. We preserve tissues for histopath. We do freeze selected tissues for other chemical analysis um, and take pieces of liver and gonad and other tissues sometimes for molecular analysis. And then uh, Cheyenne Smith, a PhD student with us with WBU has been uh, working on anterior kidney we collect for immune functional assays. So the long-term monitoring that we've been doing from 2013 to 2019 includes that biological monitoring of adults in spring and fall and then young of the year in the early summer. And it's integrate, it was integrated with surface water sampling uh, for hormones, pesticides, phytoestrogens monthly and bimonthly in the spring because we were really focused on potential agricultural sources and how that might be affecting the health. So we had two sites in the Potomac that we have that long-term data for uh, the mouth of Antietam Creek and South Branch Potomac near Moorefield, and then two sites in the Susquehanna, um, again, the mouth of Pine Creek and West Branch Makantongo. And as you can see from the, um, the map, they do vary a lot in land use. So. Pine Creek was a more forested um, site, uh, as was South Branch, although South Branch has more ag in than Pine Creek, and then Antietam Creek and West Branch Makantongo have a fair amount of agricultural land use. At the time that we started that um, pro program, we were not focused on, on PFAS, but when PFAS became a, a real issue, 
we decided to use the 2018 archived plasma samples that we had. And we had, uh, at that time, 13 different compounds were, were measured by SGS axis in British Columbia. And the concentrations that you'll see are in nanograms per ml of plasma. So we found um, four different compounds, the PFOS, PFUNA, PFDA, and PFDOA in every single plasma sample from all the sites. Uh, but you can see there's quite a range of concentration with um, the PFOS being at the highest concentration uh, up to 574 nanograms per ml. Two additional compounds were detected, but just in uh, a small number of the, the samples. We did see significant site differences uh, with PFOS. They, each site was significantly different with Antietam Creek having the highest concentrations, West Branch, Mockentongo, the next highest, uh, South Branch, third, and then Pine Creek having the lowest. When we looked at the other um, three compounds that were found in all the fish. The, the pattern was the same, but for those three, Pine Creek and South Branch, uh, Potomac didn't really differ. We also wanted to look at, um, at, at uh, both age and sex differences. We didn't see any differences in age. Uh, we, we were looking at a total of 66 males and 64. Females, um, we saw no difference in the PFOS or the PFD concentrations between males and females. However, we did see some differences between the PFD OA, OA and uh, PFUNA concentrations, which tended to be significantly higher in males than females. And that was combining all the sites. When we analyzed individually by site, um, we found pretty much the same thing, except that um, at Pine Creek, the PFDA concentrations were higher in the males that we had collected. We used that preliminary data just to look for some associations with um, land use, um, just the you know typical ag development kind of land use. Um, and we did see a very similar pattern in the upstream agricultural land use to PFOS as well as, as um, total PFOS, which is dominated by the PFOS. So we then looked to see how our numbers were comparing with other studies, but what we found early on was that it's difficult to compare to many other studies because most of the studies look at the PFAS in, in fillet or, uh, or muscle tissue or liver. However, for ones where there was tissue distribution, um, most of the species that are studied, you find the highest concentrations in the plasma and blood, um, followed by liver and then muscle. When we looked for studies worldwide that had analyzed blood or plasma, our results were actually some of the highest, which we were kind of surprised about. Um, one of the exceptions to that was striped bass from Cape Fear, North Carolina, which is downstream of a PFAS production plant. Um, so while our highest concentrations at Antietam were 574 nanograms per ml of PFOS uh, at Cape Fear, the striped bass had up to 977. So they definitely had higher concentrations. Um, but all that said to us that perhaps PFAS could be a risk factor for some of these adverse effects that we're seeing. And so we did go ahead and have additional analysis done. Um, we had plasma samples archived from 2017 and 2019, and that allowed us both a higher sample size to begin to look at potential effects, but also to look whether to see whether there were any temporal differences. We also submitted some plasma for additional sites for a larger spatial analysis. When you look at the spatial analysis of the site comparisons, the only extra site that we had in, um, in the Potomac was another site on the South Branch where we were doing some work and that was at Petersburg and it's a little lower than at Moorefield. 
Um, and up in the Susquehanna, what you see is that Chilisquaki Creek, uh, the main stem of the Susquehanna close to Sealands Grove, were all similar to the West Branch Makantongo. But then a high site was Swatara Creek. Um, for the temporal comparisons, there were differences from site to site at all four of the sites. Uh, in many cases, they were not significantly different, uh, and there was somewhat of a different pattern. So at Antietam, it almost looked like we were having somewhat of an increase over time. Uh, at South Branch, it was lower in, in 2018 and, and then higher in 17 and 19. We're looking at, at uh, environmental factors, age, things like that to see what explains those temporal differences. One of the things we did do, though, was uh, look at some of the land use attributes. Um, Stephanie Gordon in our, our group has been uh, for these four sites because they were doing a lot of, of work at these four sites, looking at uh, a huge number of land use attributes. When we combined all year seasons and sites, what we actually found was that there was a positive correlation with PFOS and total PFOS with total pesticide applications in the immediate catchment and then also the number of um, the toxic release inventory facilities in the upstream catchment. For PFDA and PFUNA, we found uh, significant correlations with, ap with biosolid applications uh, in the upstream catchment. And then per, for PFDOA, there were no significant associations. So it does suggest that in these uh, agricultural sites that pesticide application as well as biosolids may be having, having maybe a, an, an indirect source. So for the ongoing studies that we have, uh, we've now switched to a, uh, uh, well, SGS Axis has switched to another method, the EPA method, that um, looks at 40 different con compounds. We don't currently have data back from the sites in the Potomac. However, we have done some sites up in Pennsylvania. We've resampled at Swatara Creek with uh, Pennsylvania DEP. And, and what we find is that with this expanded list of compounds, we are definitely seeing uh, additional uh, chemicals ending up in the plasma of the fish. We've also taken um, other tissues in this more recent work to look at um, how it's partitioning in the fish. And in general, what we find is that plasma and blood are the highest, as has previously been found, and then liver and, and muscle. However, that's not true for all of the compounds. And so, again, we're trying to tease out some of this where, where those compounds are ending up. In the fall, um, we're, Heather Walsh, in conjunction with Maryland DNR, is uh, their population sampling. We're actually going to try to see if we can do some non-lethal collection of blood um, along the Upper Potomac to see, number one, what PFAS is, is there, but also to begin to develop some potential blood and plasma biomarkers that maybe we don't have to always do uh, lethal sampling of, of important fish species. So as far as uh, associations with biological indicators, I just wanted to give a brief um, sort of what we're looking at. We have begun to look at correlations with all our biological endpoints. We still have a lot to do. Um, and then we'd like to use that, as, depending on what we find, um, to, to then take the plasma concentrations that we're actually measuring in the smallmouth bass and begin by exposing isolated hepatocytes and anterior kidney or immune cells to evaluate gene transcript abundance as well as immune function in laboratory held smallmouth bass. Um, some of the effects, and, and Zachary mentioned some of this that have been uh, found in a, a variety of the animals, immunomodulation is one of them in humans, uh, but also in other organisms. For instance, in amphibians, they've uh, associated exposure with increased trematode infections, and we certainly see a lot of parasite infections in the smallmouth bass. Oxidative damage, chronic inflammation, reproductive endocrine disruption, dysregulation of thyroid, 
and then potential carcinogens are all potential effects. So we still have a lot of analysis to do with our biological endpoints, but I did want to just mention that uh, it does seem we are seeing some effects on the immune system of fish. Um, and fish have a, a, an immune system very similar to ours in that they have innate responses or non-specific, uh, as well as adopted, ad adaptive or acquired. So that would be uh, specific immunity. It's it's why we get vaccinated. Um, the B lymphocytes then are primed to produce antibodies. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but I do just want to say that we do seem to be seeing some uh, immunomodulatory effects. So in um, this is looking at the ability of lymphocytes to proliferate, and we are actually seeing a negative correlation um, in both males and females at Antietam Creek. At West Branch, uh, it was only in the males was it significant, although the the trends were the same. Uh, when we look at an innate response, which is the bactericidal activity or the ability of phagocytic cells to kill a certain bacteria, we see sort of a mixed bag. Um, at the south branch, we did see um, both males and females having a positive, uh, as well as the males at Antietam Creek, but then the females were different. So I think the bottom line is there's a lot we have to figure out with with these particular contaminants, um, but also recognizing that fish, wild fish are exposed to complex mixtures of numerous contaminants, other environmental stressors, parasites, pathogens. Uh, we know that these same fish have mercury in them. We, we have mercury concentrations. Uh, we know that during the spring, they're exposed to peaks of various surface water contaminants that can have some of these same effects. So we hope that by utilizing these fish health indicators, we can, we can really begin to tease out whether PFAS is having a significant effect on the health of these fish and, and which PFAS compounds might be the most important. Some of the immune stuff suggests to me that maybe the contaminants that are not at the highest levels, those the data that I showed you was a relationship to total PFAS. But we need to look at some of those contaminants that um, are at lower levels uh, because they may be more important in, as far as things like immune modulation or, or even um, relationship to cancer. So obviously we need a lot more analysis of our data as well as uh, more research. So hopefully I've gained some time here. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that this was most of this was funded by the USGS Ecosystems Mission Area, Environmental Health, Fisheries and Chesapeake Bay programs. Um, and we could not do any of this work without the many state biologists who provide such an amount of in-kind support for this in Maryland, P Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Thank you. Thank you very much for that informative presentation. Um, we do have some great questions in the chat box. Unfortunately, we are out of time for the session. I'd like to um, invite our speakers for the session to, to review those questions and see maybe you could provide answers um, via the chat box. And then otherwise, um, folks may feel free to reach out directly to our sessions to speakers. Um, their email addresses are in the conference brochure and the link to that brochure was placed in the chat box earlier. So I'd like to wrap up this session by, by thanking our two session two speakers, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Christina Davis from ICPRB, who's going to be moderating session three. Thank you.